Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Lauren Artilles, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I'm honored to introduce this virtual event with Alex Redding and Daniel K. L. Chua, presenting their new co-authored book, Alien Listening, Voyager's Golden Record in Music from Earth, moderated by Melissa Franklin. I hope everyone's doing well. Thank you so much for joining us virtually. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. Coming up in the series on Wednesday, December 1st at 5 p.m., we'll host marine biologist Helen Scales for her new book, The Brilliant Abyss, exploring the majestic hidden life of the deep ocean and the looming threat that imperils it. To learn more about this and our other upcoming virtual events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com backslash, backslash science for more info. We also have a Science Research Public Lectures YouTube channel where you can view previous talks that you might have missed, and I'll be sharing the link for that in the chat shortly. This discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk, just click on the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase Alien Listening on harvard.com as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you so much to our partners at Harvard University, and thank you to all of you for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially of science. Finally, as you may have experienced in previous virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. So if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm delighted to introduce this evening's speakers. Alex Redding is Fanny Peabody Professor of Music at Harvard University. He is the author of Beethoven's Symphony No. 9, Music and Monumentality, and Hugo Riemann and the Birth of Modern Musical Thought. Daniel K. L. Chua is Mr. and Mrs. Hung Hin Ying Professor in the Arts and Chair Professor of Music at the University of Hong Kong. He is the author of Beethoven and Freedom, Absolute Music and the Construction of Meaning, and the Gallets and Quartets of Beethoven. Melissa Franklin is an experimental particle physicist who studies proton-proton collisions produced by the Large Hadron Collider. She has worked as a postdoctoral fellow at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, an assistant professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and was a junior fellow in the Society of Fellows at Harvard before joining the Harvard faculty in 1989. Tonight, they'll be discussing Alex and Daniel's new book, Alien Listening, in which they ask the big philosophical and scientific questions implied by the project of the Golden Record, the capsule of earthbound sounds that NASA shot into the space in 1977, which remains the only human-made object to have left the solar system. Can music truly literally function as a universal language? How can we create a sonic time capsule that represents all of human culture? And do aliens even have ears? Nina Eidsham writes, this book made me laugh out loud and then reflect on my own place in the galaxy. It would fit equally well in music theory, musicology, philosophy, and aesthetics curricula, and it is a must read for friends, neighbors, and aliens alike. And John Peter says, to boldly go where no one has gone and ask what music might be. This book undertakes this mission with glee, wit, and imaginative flair. Without further ado, I'm excited to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Alex, Daniel, and Melissa. Thanks Hi. so much. Hi. So I have had so much fun reading this book. Um, I'm teaching waves and sound waves just this week. And, uh, and it's so interesting to see a completely different way of thinking about sound waves and sound and frequency and wavelength. Um, it's, it completely makes me happy. But um, I was wondering whether, um, Alex, you could give us a little introduction to what's in the book so that we don't miss anything, because I have so many questions that I, I don't want to miss the, the big picture. Absolutely. I, I made a tiny little slideshow, just mostly so you don't always have to look at me, um, but can see some pretty pictures. So um, while I'm setting that up, I have to remember to um, share the screen. And for some reason, you always have to announce that you're sharing the screen. Um, except now, ah, this is where I want to be. And so let's 
play? So first of all, it's definitely unusual to have two musicologists at this event and uh, at a science event. And we hope that we'll do justice to the occasion. Thanks so much for having us. It's a real pleasure to be here. And it's, you know, we're especially thrilled to be here because one of the goals of our book is to move our own discipline music theory out of its splendid isolation into which it has maneuvered itself um, and to start a dialogue with other disciplines or really rather to, to rekindle a dialogue that once existed but you know stopped a few centuries ago and we will probably talk a little more about that um, a little later but let's start by setting the scene. And I want to start by talking about the golden record. That's sort of the central object in this book. It's a very sprawling book that goes into all sorts of directions, but the golden record um, kind of holds it all together. And for those of you who don't know the, the Voyager golden record, that was a project that happened almost half a century ago um, in 1977, when humans sent a message into outer space and they chose to use music as a greeting for whoever might be out there in our galaxy. And there was a team of fearless astromusicologists, uh, six people, Carl Sagan, his then wife, Linda Salzman Sagan, as well as his future wife, Andrean, as well as uh, the founder of SETI, the study of extraterrestrial intelligence, Frank Drake, the visual artist, John Lomberg, the music and the music producer Timothy Ferris, and so those six figures um, sat down and tried to figure out how to represent our whole planet to extraterrestrials using nothing but music and sound. And the fruit of their labor is what is now known as the Golden Record. On August the twentieth and September the fifth, nineteen seventy-seven, two spacecraft, Voyagers one and two, were launched and attached to each uh, spacecraft was one golden record. And everybody at the time understood exactly what this was, that the golden record, despite appearances, was really a mixtape. After all, this was the 1970s and people were just exchanging mixtapes at the time. And another gesture that is really incredibly characteristic of the 1970s, the golden record even carries a handwritten note in the run out groove and it says to the makers of music, all worlds, all times. And you, can, you can't really see that very well. That's why I, um, why I copied it. But uh, this is the best photo uh, of the golden record that I could find. So Tim Ferriss, who etched this personal note on the record was actually being naughty. After all, NASA was trying really hard not to include any words or any text or anything that would impede communication with extraterrestrial civilizations. And they even included a wordless instruction sheet that we see here to explain how to build a makeshift turntable and how to make the record give up its sounding secrets. Now, the instruction manual here is really tricky to decipher. It requires substantial knowledge of physics and chemistry. So for instance, the aliens would have to know what the 21 centimeter line is and how the hyperfine transition of hydrogen works. And when I teach my undergraduate class on the golden record, I usually get Melissa to explain that part because she is much better at it than I am. And so if the aliens don't figure out that part, then they have no chance of understanding anything else that we can see on this diagram. So this is really key. Now, Carl Sagan and his team had great confidence in the ability of the aliens that he imagined that they would listen to the golden record at the other end. And so he imagined most importantly that they would have ears just like ours, um, or at least similar to ours, ears that would be able to hear somehow the music that we recorded on the golden record. And Sagan must have also imagined that the aliens that would pick up the record would have hands or hand-like structures. So, and putting all that, all these assumptions together, 
it's not wrong to think of Carl Sagan's aliens as humans plus in that they can do everything that we can do, but then they can also do more than we are capable of doing. Um, you know, they have superior technological uh, understanding and they are just generally more advanced than us. Um, the most important part was that he imagined that extraterrestrials that would pick up the golden record at the other end would definitely be interested in science. Um, he was quite sure of that because otherwise, why would they be interested in picking up anything in the first place? Or how would they be able to uh, develop the technology that was necessary in order to do anything with the golden record? And so science is really the glue that binds. And that's also one of the reasons why numbers and specifically binary numbers were allowed on the golden record because he felt that numbers were pretty much universally understood. And there was one other thing on the golden record that was allowed and that was profoundly human and that was music. So the, the golden record contains a very small selection of the staples of the classical uh, concert circuit, Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, and Stravinsky. It also contains some popular music, Louis Armstrong, Blind Willie Johnson, and Chuck Berry. The Beatles did not make it onto the golden record. But the lion's share of the mixtape is given to traditional music from all over the world, from Azerbaijani bagpipes to Australian didgeridoo music. And the team around Carl Sagan only had six weeks to compile this uh, playlist. And that's really an amazing feat if you think about it. Six weeks is no time at all. And in, in addition, they tried to pack as much sonic information about our blue planet onto the record as possible. The record includes all sorts of sounds, rain and thunder, the cry of a baby, a kiss, and the heartbeat of Andrean and her brain waves as she was thinking of her love of Carl. And they also included 115 images, sonified images from planet Earth that they stored on the record as what we hear as buzzing sounds. It's, uh, it's, it's quite an interesting experience. But one aspect that makes it so fascinating to look back on this project now from the vantage point of the 21st century is how fundamentally the situation has changed in the meantime. Back then in 1977, the idea of extraterrestrial civilizations or even extraterrestrial life was a pipe dream. It was the stuff of science fiction. Um, but since then, we've really learned a lot about exoplanets that wasn't known then. Astrophysicists expect that there are billions and billions in our galaxy, to use that term that was popularized by Carl Sagan. And last night I checked, and NASA reports uh, uh, 4,569 exoplanets that have been confirmed, and there are more that are found every day. So from a purely statistical perspective, the tables have now turned, and it seems rather unlikely now that we should be alone in the universe, that there should be no one else out there. Now, I should say that the existence of other life forms in the universe is one thing, and one of them finding the golden record and actually listening to it is quite another. But there's a non-zero chance that something like this might actually happen. To be sure, none of us will be around to witness this, because the earliest time that the voyages will be closer to another star than to the sun is at least 40,000 years from now. So this is an enormous time span and there is a dizzying range of uh, possibilities in this crazy and ambitious attempt at interplanetary communication that opens up a large field of, for speculation. And that's precisely what Daniel and I are zooming in in our book, Alien Listening. And the questions that the Golden Record raises for us are really the broadest issues that anyone in musicology can study. How can music represent all of humankind? What remains of listening if we can't even take ears for granted? And what exactly do we mean by music in this impossibly broad scenario? So, 
Meanwhile, the two Voyager spacecraft are barreling through outer space at 35,000 miles per hour on their long journey into the unknown. But the questions that the golden record has given us and that we tried to answer in this book, they matter right now and right here on Earth. And with this, I'll stop my slideshow. Wonderful, that was, that was a wonderful introduction. Um, I was, uh, it's just, yeah, this is a wonderful book and it has all kinds of parts in it and it has instructions on how to read it and which parts to skip if you're more, more one kind of person than another kind of person. Um, in, in this book, I wanted uh, you to hear the audience to hear a little bit of what the writing is like, because it's quite beautiful and uh, writing that really does make you laugh a lot. Um, I think uh, Daniel, um, in the book, you, you, you both say that music is a, a universal language, so that um, that's why you think it's a good idea to talk to aliens with music. Um, and, but, you know, we often think of science as the universal language. <laughs> you know, we send up the 21 centimeter line of hydrogen, it, a particular uh, number, and, we, and because physics is the same everywhere in the universe, we think uh, the aliens will know that. Um, so I was wondering, Daniel, whether you wanted to read a little passage about why you think music is, is so important. Yeah, here's a passage from one of the chapters. Uh, this is a chapter on um, uh, how other species on our own planet might be listening to music, because one of our theories is that actually um, different ears hear music differently. And this is a passage that refers, I think, to uh, uh, Darwin's idea of sexual attraction and why uh, NASA might send uh, the golden record into space. So here's a short paragraph. Why should NASA's interstellar mating call be musical? Because music is an attractor, an over-communicator, an interminable repeater, a mind trap. It overcompensates to overcome the gap. Human music in particular, with its playful recursions from rhythmic diminutions and octave doublings to formal expansions and motivic compressions, spins a web of intersecting cycles to catch the ear of another. What this ensures is that its recursive frequencies will somehow connect with the unknown, albeit inaccurately and inadequately. But a mating call need only attract engagement. In our selection of non-normative listening, it was not that nothing happened along the frequency spectrum, something happened, just not as we know it. Thank you. Um, uh, you guys, I think, uh, well, sorry, you talk a lot about exomusicology. I had to look it up. I also found some websites where people make exomusical music, uh, music of aliens, even though they're not aliens, music they think are aliens. Um, you say this is a kind of 70s humankind mixtape, but you're trying to come up with an intergalactic music theory of everything. Um, and which seems a little tongue in cheek is taking off on the physics theory of everything. But what are the problems with your theory? What is, first of all, what is exomusicology? <laughs> <laughs> what is your theory? And what are the problems? With theory? And, well, also, okay. and also, one last thing, is it a theory like in science that can predict something? Or in musicology, do you make predictions? Oh, those are lots of questions. So first of all, I had no idea that anyone other than us uses the term exomusicology. We thought we'd invest, invented it. But then the internet shows us that, that we haven't. Um, we, we were torn between astromusicology and exomusicology. And so, you know, just like there is this move, the question between, you know, astrobiology and the exoplanets and, you know, um, we, we set eventually on exomusicology, but the, the implication is, is pretty much the same as, uh, as for these branches of, uh, of the astronomical sciences that we're interested in um, life on, other planets and so the music on other planets outside of the earth that's why hence the exo now what is exomusicology ecology is um is an approach to music that thinks beyond humans so um one one of the 
one of the um, points that we spent a fair amount of time on is to first, you know, figure out what exactly is music, and uh, you know, and, and we start out with with that playlist from the Golden Record, which is really, you know trying very hard to be fair to all sorts of different musical traditions on earth. Um, and it is, you know, it's uh, something that we might want to call world music, um, even though, you know, that term has all sorts of uh, connotations. But, um, uh, but what's interesting in, in this context is that as soon as you put it on a spaceship and set it away from earth, all the cultural connotations that sort of signify different parts of the earth fall away because there is no information given on that spaceship that would explain the differences. And so, um, you know, that makes it very confusing. Um, it also gives us and, you know, the listener, whoever the listener might be, enormous flexibilities because they can create new connections and they can create new categories for grouping this music. So, you know, I mean, I, there's... Uh, um, you know, one one of one of the one of the little uh, details that I like so much about the the Golden Record is that they included two pieces by Beethoven and three pieces by Bach. You know, despite their um, intention of being really very broad and uh, and and global uh, about all this, and they said we are including these multiple pieces by the same composers because we want the aliens to be able to make meaningful comparisons. So they they really had this idea in their in their head that that um, you know alien listeners would see the music analytically, like you know like music theorists would be like they pour over the music and try to figure out how it hangs together and how it relates to other pieces um at the same time i think the assumption is that you know the same composer wrote these pieces so that's what connects them whereas if you don't already know that if you don't already have a sense of what style is and what musical genres are and you know all these things that we learn either you know that we either learn at school or that we kind of pick up as we listen to the radio um and you know learn about different kinds of musics that's not a given at all in other cultures and so you know other categories that could be really banal might be much more prominent in you know in that situation where like you have a fast piece of music you have a slow piece of music um, or, you know, one that plays in, in the higher range and one in, in the lower range, you know, something like that. But the notion of the stylistic unity and the geographical, political, cultural um, categories that we draw, draw with even thinking about it, they don't mean anything. So all that was a very long explanation to say what we mean by exomusicology, that as soon as you get beyond all the things that we take for granted on Earth, we kind of have to go back to basics and figure out what it is that we're actually doing. Um, and that answers some of your, question, but your questions, but yes. by far not all of them. And maybe Danielle should, should also say something. <laughs> yes, why not? Okay, the, the question on intergalactic music theory of everything, obviously, oh, yeah. it's a tongue in cheek uh, phrase, but actually, it, it really does pick up on what Carl Sagan's team is trying to do because you wouldn't send music in space. If you didn't have some kind of theory of why you think music would work in space. So I think as a music theorist, we try to work out what on earth they were thinking in doing this. Um, and it turns out actually that, you know, if you went back in time to say Pythagoras or even Confucius and you said, and this is an intergalactic music theory of everything, they would absolutely believe you because that was exactly what music theory was way back in the ancient world. So in one sense, we're doing nothing new here. We're just bringing back something that was very ancient and thinking about, well, if music exists outside of the, the human sphere, if it is cosmic in some way, what is music and how would this work in the universe? What kind of thing would it be? So I think that's what an intergalactic music theory of everything is about. It's not a predictive thing. It's a, way, it's a speculative thing that's trying to work out whether music is cosmic, whether it's everywhere. And if it is, then we might be able to communicate with another species 
on another planet. So that's the idea behind that. So that's really interesting. So in this book, you talk about Pythagoras and you talk about a myth, and I'm not sure why it's a myth. I mean, obviously it's, we don't know whether it's true about Pythagoras listening to a person with a mallet hitting a metal and anvil. I don't know. anvil. Anvil, yeah. with an anvil. And that somehow music all of a sudden, the, okay. But what, what's interesting is your book is called Alien Listening, but there is a thing that people do on the earth called alien listening, where they are listening for any kind of message, very simple message, nothing like Bach or Beethoven, just like the anvil hitting. Like they're saying, if we we're, we're sitting here listening, I mean, obviously not for sound waves, but for, for instance, light waves, we're listening for something that comes and it doesn't make any sense. Like it's like hitting like, like a, a blacksmith, right? So it's kind of interesting, these two alien listenings. This is, is very, um, you know, the golden record, they were pretty wild uh, about this. I, I guess you guys are also wild. So I like, what I like is you pick up from the golden record being a kind of wild thing. First of all, you send a rec record on a spaceship into outer space and probably no one will ever see it. It's a complete shot in the dark. The only thing that can happen is that someone in another spaceship can come get the spaceship and find it. Um, but then you start thinking about aliens and you start thinking about, well, I don't know any aliens, but I know things that seem alien on the earth like whales and they seem pretty smart. So what happens if the aliens were like whales, how could they play the record, <laughs> you know? Um, and how did they hear? And it's kind of, I find that very interesting. I, I wondered then, uh, you talked about whales sort of hearing with their jaws. Um, uh, and I was wondering whether, uh, first of all, there's another five questions that you can answer anyone of. <laughs> um, how many times did you listen to the golden record? And have you ever tried listening to the golden record with your jaw? Like get, <laughs> have your ears filled and just put the, the uh, uh, <laughs> just That's put the such a good idea. <laughs> we haven't tried why, this ha one. why haven't we done that? <laughs> I know we should have done that, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> that but you also really need a brain funny. the size of a whale um, in order to really get the full effect. Oh, really? Well, I think so. I mean, I think if you're a whale listening to the golden record underwater uh, with that size of a brain, you would hear the entire oceanscape as well, uh, you know, with this kind of echolocation <laughs> experience. So it's a very different, it's a very alien experience. If you tried to put yourself, you know, if you could even imagine putting yourself you know, in, in the body of a whale. Uh, I think that's one of the points we're making. Actually, there is no, you know, there's always going to be a filter or some kind of interface that will not work perfectly uh, in any, you know, you will not hear the same thing. Ah. Interesting. So have you listened to the, this record either? Have, Daniel, have you listened 50 times to the whole record? Sure. Have you listened to the whole record again? <laughs> oh, yes. oh, yes, of course. <laughs> yes. I mean, all together at one it's time. It's a great like... compilation. I mean, it's a great compilation, by the way. It's not, they really chose it on aesthetic grounds. And every piece is not an excerpt. It's really a whole piece. So actually, it does make, uh, it, it does make compelling listening. And, and have you thought, I'm sure you have, if you, you know, if they decided to do another pass at this and you were the person who got to choose the music, um, what would it be? Would it be more, would it be more simpler or have you learned anything from your travels through this, this uh, exomusicology that would help you to um, send something that's easier for them to understand? So that's a really great question. I think the one thing I've learned after listening it, listening to it way too many times is how grateful I am that made the selection because I think the hardest thing for me would be to say, you know, you have however much time, 45 minutes, um, go. And, you know, there are all the things that I would want to put on it. And then, uh, you know, making the decision of, you know, one piece, but not the other is really hard. And I take my hat off to them for making that decision and, you know, kind of fitting that music on there. Um, you know, uh, I mean, there, there are there are a number of, of gaps, the geographic 
gaps that that um, that we would now probably want to fill in. Um, so there's no Caribbean music uh, included, and that's uh, that's a pretty important tradition. There's no Middle Eastern music included. Um, I you know I have a huge soft spot for uh, throat singing. I think it's a remarkable sound. I would like to see that on my personal golden record. Um, I have a couple of personal favorites um, that that I would like to to put on there. Um, but yeah, making it easier. That's a that's a that's a really great question. Um, Daniel, do you have <laughs> any thoughts on that? Well, you know, I think when they were making the golden record, um, well, there, well, there's a very famous story that Andrew and always tells about how she sent her brainwaves and they were she was thinking of her love for Carl Sagan. And so in a way, this whole golden record is a kind of love letter uh, to aliens uh, into space. And actually, th th this is also true of the people who selected the music because they were doing it on a very personal level. In a way, they were trying to send the music that they loved uh, into space. Uh, and I think that's all you can possibly do, because as Alex was saying earlier, once you send it into space, it's a kind of contextless place for this music to be. We have no idea who will receive it or, or the, their kind of ears or if, whether they even have ears. And they all, all they will have is all these you know, uh, cycles of frequencies and repetition and rhythms, right, for them to decipher in some way. So everything is kind of lost in that. So I think all you can possibly do when you put something on the golden record, you can put anything you want that you truly love uh, on there. But of course, you have to be privileged enough to be on that team uh, in order to do that. Uh, so that, that's how I feel about it. You know, it, in, in, the, in the end, it is really a mixed tape. You know, you're sending something that is, you know, uh, from the earth that is personal to you, but hoping, hoping to represent uh, everything on earth, which is not possible. So, so um, many questions. I have like a billion questions, um, but um, you know, sound is and space don't go together, right? So uh, clearly we can't send a sound wave that through space. Um, so sound seems like a very odd thing to, to be sent to be sending, even though that you know we make we we make the record here and they have the record there, they probably have earphones. Probably, <laughs> I'm guessing. <laughs> I'm guessing. Um, I'm guessing. Uh, but you know, um, but you seem to think you seem to make a case for the fact that music is the thing to send, and music comes through sound. Um, so, is there any other way to um, take this thing we call music and put it in a different form, which doesn't go? as pressure waves through air. Is there, and, and okay, so that's one question. I'm sorry for so many questions. The other question is if you were an alien, I mean, here's your problem. I mean, your problem in the book <laughs> is the only aliens you can think of are, are weird things on earth. And, and even those weird things you embellish with extra teeth. <laughs> but, but, um, but, you know, you would have to think of an alien and think what would they send us if they were sending us their mixtape? What would it sound like? I, I think if the people listening here now would like to know if there was an exomusicology, what they would send us so we know what to look for. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it makes sense. It's just a difficult question. <laughs> well, you guys are obviously very smart. I mean, I read the book. <laughs> We, we just like to make puns. Um, now, so there is one really banal answer, right? I mean, if something like something like this arrived, then the mere sign that, you know, something has arrived, that's a deliberate message, not some random thing, would indicate that there must be life out there in the universe somewhere else. And that's, that's enough. That would be the bottom line. Um, there is, you know, there is a there is a historical reason why they chose music. Um, the previous mission by NASA, the Pioneer mission, had used the plaque, the you know the the iconic um, plaque that shows a naked man and a naked woman. You know, the man is is holding up his hand as a greeting, and you have the pulsar map, uh, and you have the the sun with nine little planets and. Uh, and you have an arrow pointing away from the third planet from the sun uh, with a tiny little version of the Pioneer spacecraft. Um, and when NASA 
use that, they got into a, a huge amount of trouble because they showed humans in full nudity, full frontal nudity. And so um, the, you know, especially the religious right was incensed by that. And there was a very real concern on NASA's part that because it's funded by taxpayers' money, that, um, you know, that the, that they might lose their funding if, uh, you know, if that's a problem. And so they felt that music was less controversial than, than visual images. Um, and there is this real tension in, in the way in which uh, um, NASA, and especially Frank Drake, um, uh, conceived this message because Drake was really very convinced by the immediate explanatory power of images. Um, and he, he writes about that in, in the documentation of the Golden Record. So, so Frank Drake wrote the equation that tells you how many, sorry, what is it? How many, how many civilizations which are more advanced than us exist now in the... Yeah. In the galaxy. Right. Never. I mean, it's, yeah, the, the Drake equation um, is, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's trying to calculate the likelihood of us uh, finding civilizations that we can be in contact with. And it's sort of, you know, all the variables that are involved in making this possible piled on top of each other. And of course, you know, we, we don't know most of these numbers for certain. Um, and so, you know, it is, you know, it's, it's one approach. There is, uh, there is a very different approach um, to that problem that Sarah Seeger uh, at MIT is, uh, is working on, and she's sort of taking a biosignature approach. She's not interested in the question of technology so much and, you know, whether messages can be sent, but she is interested in what can we observe from here about other planets that would give us signs for life forms you know, that have uh, had an, in, an impact on the atmosphere, on the biosignature of, um, of those uh, other exoplanets. She gave a talk at the physics department last week. Yeah, yeah. interesting. So, um, so you, you, you seem, in your book, you seem to have hope that because there's going to be so many exoplanets, even though there's only 4,000 now, <laughs> that will change the Drake equation into saying there's going to be a lot of, a lot of uh, civilizations. Um, but I guess you two as musicologists, okay, so here's what I'm thinking. A musicologist is somebody who probably knows something about the structure of music, right? Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So, so, <laughs> if, if, so here's my question, like if an alien sent us a rhythm Do you know all the rhythms that there are, all the possible rhythms, you know, the, the set of all rhythms that are human music? And so you, could you still recognize a rhythm um, if it was alien or does that even make any sense? I mean, you, you talk a little bit about rhythms in your book and um, sorry. <laughs> so uh, can you, yeah. We'll, so yeah, we'll go, go ahead, Daniel. Go ahead. <laughs> so in, in our book, basically, our intergalactic music theory of everything is based on the idea of repetition. In other words, music basically repeats itself. So let's not think about harmony and melody for a moment. Just think about basic repetition. And our, our premise is that music is non-identical repetition. Uh, and that's the all that you need, in fact, in making human music is repetition. So whether you talk about rhythm or pitch or even form, these are just different uh, scales of repetition and we sort of combine them all together. So human music is very particular. So if an alien were to send a rhythm to us, uh, I, I would doubt personally uh, that we would uh, necessarily be able to figure it out uh, very clearly, let's put it that way. And, the, and our theory basically posits that, uh, that music happens along the spectrum of repetition from the slowest to the fastest. Okay, so it's, 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 it's a theoretically infinite. It's like a huge glissando. Uh, and that's the side of music. And human music is just in a very niche uh, bit of that bandwidth there. Now, now, the alien could be operating on a completely different bit of that bandwidth, right, where we cannot even perceive it. 
Um, or maybe they were operating on that bit of the dog band bandwidth that we can't even hear, right? Um, so, you know, we have to figure that into the equation as well. So that may not connect. Um, so there are many things here where basically our theory says there is always going to be a gap. There's always going to be a point where, you know, nothing may happen. Uh, even if you send all this information out there, maybe there's tons of music being sent to us. We may not even be able to pick it up uh, because we're actually in, on the wrong bit of the spectrum. But it doesn't mean that music isn't there. It's just that our ears, um, uh, we, we, we explain it as we fold music in a particular way on a little bit of the bandwidth. And that's why we talk about other species. They will fold it in a different way on another bit of the bandwidth uh, that uh, we won't be able to understand. But I would say this, uh, if we picked up something uh, we would, uh, something, let's call it intelligent, something where we feel, ah, oh, this is a pattern, right? This is repetition that's happening in a particular way. Uh, and it's just not a natural thing, as it were. Uh, I think we'd be able to figure out that something strange is happening. Something is communicating. Something is out there. Uh, it's the same as um, when we listen to whale song. We have no idea what, what it means or whether it's even really a song. Uh, but we imagine all kinds of things from it, right? We make a lot out of it. And I think that, you know, we, we think we're communicating, but it doesn't really matter in the sense that it fires our imagination to hear, right? To, to imagine that they're singing to us or singing to the universe in some way. So wait a second, you mean you as musicologists in the 21st century have not figured out whale, whale music? No, we, we can't. No, no. <laughs> so, no. So I know that it's you can... So it's just it, it's not just what frequencies they use because I know that we can listen to caterpillars, can't we? We just okay, what? we are well we we record them and then we just change the frequency to something we can hear, so we yeah, can right. hear in our band. Yeah, yeah. But but um, I see. So it's really musicology is really far back. If it, even the aliens on our own planet, we don't know if they're making music. Is that? That is I mean, true. That is true. It's 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 I a see. sad indictment. So I, if, if we found something, if SETI, the, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, found a signal and they sent it to you, what would you do with it? What Do musicologists have like a, a bag of tools that they, that they use? <laughs> Sorry, like a... <laughs> Not yet. one reason for writing this book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we don't. The, the reason, I mean, this is a weird book. I mean, he, I mean, musicologists have been obsessed with human music for yes. a long time. And basically, uh, uh, you know, we think of great works and it's basically, you know, Beethoven, Bach. But the really great music is the cosmic music, right? But we haven't been thinking about that for several centuries now. Uh, and so, in, in a way, uh, we're not quite equipped, but we need to begin from somewhere. And this book is a kind of first stab at proposing something, I think. Is that right, Alex? Mm -hmm. you think yeah, you yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think that is right. There, there, there is, we, you know, we, we haven't done this before. I think, you know, the um, linguistics in some ways is, is much further along. I think the idea of, you know, deciphering messages and encoding messages is much further along. And, you know, I mean, one really useful tool here is, uh, is actually science fiction. And I mean, you know, I know, uh, I know uh, we often don't take it terribly seriously, but one, it's, it's a, it, it can be a really useful way of thinking through the possibilities in a, you know, in a relatively risk-free and low stakes uh, uh, scenario. And one of the, you know, one, um, one of the the blockbuster movies of uh, of the last few years was uh, um, what's it called? Not was it Arrival? Um, the story yeah. of my life, the, the Te Chiang story, where you know, wh which is about um, an, a linguist learning to decipher this this alien language, um, and in some ways, you know, language is a more obvious model for us for communication um, but the question of of using music for communication is not unheard of right I mean in the the most famous and terrifying uh, uh, movie science fiction movie of the 1970s it certainly terrified me when I was seven years old when it came out was uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind where they had this uh, funny dialogue with music um, and, uh, you know, apparently Carl Sagan hated that whole movie, except for that scene with music. Um, so yeah, maybe it is time that musicology, 
uh, up the ante and develop the, an exomusicology. Well, well, actually, is is uh, sorry, I don't know. Even though my um, the physics building is right next to the music building here, at Harvard, <laughs> right here, <laughs> right here yeah. I I don't actually know much of what happens in the music building. Um, uh, do musicologists? Um, uh, I mean, have you made any progress in the sorry understanding human music in the past? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think and so. So what would be an example of um, a step forward there? I mean, what would be something that we've learned in the past 20 years about? Um... <laughs> Sorry, it seems, it seems like, this seems like a question which is not a very good question. <laughs> Let me help you here. No, I think that when we, we, we learn many things, I mean, for, uh, and, uh, you know, obviously we come up with different theories of how music works. And I think in the area of, you know, music psychology and so on, I think that's also growing. So, you know, we also have to figure out how we understand the brain and, and all that as well. So I think that, there, you know, we do move in those areas. I think for, for this particular book, the interesting thing about music is just, you know, is that it, it, it is in some sense scientific. I mean, we are talking about, you know, uh, uh, you know, discrete particles or waveforms, right? In different, and, and so in that sense, we can begin to theorize music in more scientific ways. And I think that's the key thing here and what we're trying to do. And this is, I don't think it's necessarily new in that we've always, there's always been a physics of music, right? Um, but then you know, to, to what use do you put it to? Most of the time we are just thinking about humans and human music. Uh, but now we're saying, well, actually, you know, maybe we should go back for that very ancient uh, concept or, the, uh, or that is sort of represented by the golden record uh, and begin to think in much bigger ways so that we can actually include more people in the music theory conversation. Because our problem in music theory is that it is so narrow and the, and the music that we talk about is so narrow uh, that uh, we, sometimes we really fail to see the bigger picture of what music means. Well, actually, actually, I think this book is going to do it. I think you're going to go. I think I think if the people read this book, I I read it and I my my brain was on fire. Um, we we actually have a a, um, uh, an, a question from the audience. Eleanor Rubinstein says, "Do we on Earth try to communicate feelings that music evoke? It's about our need to engage with feelings of love." Question mark. So I guess this is the. Um, I guess that's a question about. Could we just send the feelings into outer space? Yeah. And I think I think that's a really great question. I think that plays a huge part in this. So you know, it, just to pick up on what I was saying earlier, that you know, the the banal answer on the the bargain basement answer is just any sign of a deliberate message is enough um, for the other side. But there is also you know to come back to the notion of the mixtape that we talked about earlier. I think it really is a mixtape um, in, you know, in a very literal sense. If you remember that time when you poured, you know, your innermost feelings into that tape, you just, you know, you gave away something very personal about yourself. It's the labor of love. It takes forever to make a mixtape. It really, you know, it's a lot of work. You only do it for a very special person. And then you hand over something that's really intensely personal. And I think that's also true, just not on a, you know, uh, it, on the golden record. It's just not for one person, but for one species, one planet, um, you know, on a, on a large scale communal level. And the, the idea of, you know, giving away something about our emotional life, using music for that is very, very important. Um, and, you know, in some cases, we know explicitly that this was the case. I mean, you know, we mentioned the, the love story with, uh, with Andrean and Carl Sagan. Um, the last piece on the golden record, um, the Cavatina by Beethoven, one of the, from one of the late string quartets, is their love song, right? And so there you have this idea of, of feelings of love. Um, of the emotions that are expressed in music. Um, and they, you know, it's a love song that will be going through the universe pretty much forever. And uh, so, I, yeah, go ahead. 
No, no, no. I mean, that's a great idea. I, by the way, I did listen to the cavatina through my jaw. Um, <laughs> it was incredible. Yeah. <laughs> um, so did so did Beethoven. That was Beethoven's way of listening as well. So yeah, that's, exactly. Uh... Um, um, so the, uh, someone asked, anonymous asked, I'm struck by the lonely plight mm -hmm. of the voyager, forever alone in space, no contact with Earth and no return. In mm -hmm. your work with the voyager, on Voyager and about Voyager, do you ever feel emotional about the fate of this inanimate object? Oh, I, I do. I, I, <laughs> you do, Alex. You have feelings for them. Okay. <laughs> <I> feel like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just think it's such uh, a, you know, a, a romantic idea to yeah. do this in the first place, right? I, it goes back to the previous question as well. And the idea that actually does the passage be read that I read about you know this mating call that's going out almost to nowhere right it's almost like a like it, it's almost uh, you know it's going to be a, a void out there that you're, you're you're crying out to hoping to find a mate uh, and by the time they find you you'll probably be extinct as a, as a species there's this sort of ultimate a uh, crazy kind of uh sexual attraction um so there is in that sense in which it is extremely lonely but there's also the sense in which um you know as alex was saying it, it is also uh uh, sending love and peace into the universe. I mean, this was, you know, I think still uh, sort of uh, leftovers from the 60s, actually, of uh, yeah. uh, that sense of love and peace. Um, so that's going out there. I think for Carl Sagan, music was an emotional language. I mean, it's a universal emotional language in some sense, as well as a scientific language. I think the both sort of uh, coalesce uh, for, for, for Sagan. I'm not so sure that the alien will get the emotional part, but, um, but the scientific part, I'm, I'm sure they'll figure out they have. But if, you, if you had you put your life's work in a bottle and put it in the ocean and hope that someone would find it, like, that would be pretty tragic, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, yeah. Um, so Emmer, Emmer O'Dwyer writes, when writing this book, how often did you come to dead ends where you felt that the logic guiding your question or inquiry just petered out when confronted with a vastness of uncertainty regarding exomycology? aliens understanding physics, et cetera, et cetera. What did you do at those moments? Delete and restart or just reconfigure and reconfigure again your thoughts or just throw out the logic? <laughs> and I just have to say to preface whatever answers you have, this is a very intellectually playful book. So I, it seems like every interesting thought you had is included. <laughs> Am I wrong? No filter. <laughs> no, 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 that's not what I meant. I, I just meant it, it, it's I very mean, yeah. full of, of, it's very rich. It's very rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so what, who's going to answer this one? So, so I, 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 oh, look, oh, dead ends. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> actually, our, our book, our book is actually premised in one sense on, on, on dead ends, uh, because you have to figure that into your equation. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you don't figure that into your equation, then you're not going to write the right kind of book. And I think we mentioned at the end, you know, this uh, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there's this thing called the Babel fish. There's able, it's like the Rosetta Stone of, uh, of of intergalactic space, where this little animal, a little fish, is able to translate every single language, you know, in the universe, so you can understand. But that's exactly what is not possible, and exactly what you don't want to have, because you will never have a real encounter if everything was that uh, transparent. So the question of uncertainty, the question of the gap, the question of not being able to make that connection is very important in the way we theorize uh, the ideas in this book. So it's included in there, which is why we probably didn't come to too much of a kind of uh, dead end because it was already there in our theory. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's a, that, that's very well put. I mean, I think we started from the premise that, the, you know, there there are so many things that we cannot know, and that it's it is you know, and you know, we we admire the project, but it is a fool's errand. I think you know, as you as you as you're saying, Melissa, it's a it's a wild stab in the dark. I mean, they have sent out two spacecraft in different directions. That means we have two chances, and that's it. Which is nothing. Um, so there is there is a sense in which you know the makers of the Golden Record already knew that this was kind of a crazy project. And you know, Carl Sagan, I think, says, "Well, we're really a baby civilization. We're not ready to 
send out messages in a way that would make sense, but this is the best we can do. And so, the, you know, our project is really thinking through the possibilities, given that we don't know anything. Um, what can we know? What can we, you know, what on what assumptions can we build this theory, uh, knowing that everything is hypothetical? And, you know, just as we were saying earlier that, you know, we we put our hearts, feelings into the golden record, and we have no idea what happens at the other end. But on one level, it it is also about, about us. It's kind of a way of learning more about ourselves. And so when we're saying we're sort of trying to imagine what music might be like without human listeners, that's, you know, that's entirely speculative. But it also helps clarify a lot of things that we normally would take for granted because we don't think beyond certain boundaries. And that's, I think that's ultimately where, uh, what we're trying to do with the project. Uh, there's another question from the audience, which is, uh, which is one we've all had, I think. Was there any concern that music might represent something very different to an alien culture? For example, what if music is only used as an insult or, or to declare war? <laughs> yes. We cannot interpret our sending them <laughs> as a friendly gesture. So, so I, in your book, you talk about uh, someone who sends a greeting, which is equivalent to, have you eaten? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, so I, I noticed that they're not sending out any more lately, right? Like we've stopped sending. These, yeah. These yes. Come and get me messages, right? So that's that's an interesting point because I I mean I only just learned about this. There was an equivalent Russian project. Um, I mean, in in two thousand one, um, a Russian um, astrophysicist Alexander Zaitsev was. Uh, trying to put together a concert and it was actually not a record not not a um, compilation but an actual concert of theremin music of sort of the greatest hits um, and he sent this into outer space um, and he was he he was hoping to use Arecibo for this um, the the radio uh, um, observatory in uh, Puerto Rico that was just shut down recently um, but that wasn't uh, that that wasn't permitted because precisely what you're saying because there is a real risk of sending out messages um, because you know I mean our assumption Carl Sagan's assumption was that if there are other civilizations they will be happy to communicate with us but that's not a given um, <laughs> we have absolutely no idea what's going to happen and you know someone like Stephen Hawking was absolutely opposed to um, sending messages because we're giving away our position. And if, you know, anyone who might be out there is not friendly, but hostile, then we've just made a crucial error that, you know, a fatal error uh, without even knowing it. Um, and so, yes, there have been very few messages since then. There's, there's one more question. I know we're almost time to stop, but there's one more question. It's not actually a question, but it's a, it's a comment that I, I like. Someone is, Kit Tempest is commenting. Um, it seems a bit hopeless, I'm not sure what, but the, the way our brains work, if something is faster than 20 frames per second, we perceive it as something else. A two against three rhythm sped up starts being perceived as a harmonic interval the same way as still pictures become perceived as motion in film. That sounds like a musicologist, perhaps. That, <laughs> we that, talk about that in our book. <laughs> that's great. That, is, that is precisely what we're talking about in the book. So yes, um, I, I don't see this as hopeless. I, I, I think it's maybe, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think we're quite excited by that, by the possibility that um, you know, certain physical phenomena could be perceived in very different ways. And this is, you know, um, we, we were reading earlier from, from the chapter where we kind of go through different um, systems of audition that we know about here on Earth, and they're very, very different, right? I mean, dog whistles, we know, for instance, they operate at a frequency range that we can't hear, um, but that dogs can hear very well. At. And so, the, you know, we, what we're trying to draw attention to is that our ears are active participants in the hearing process. And, you know, this is just a way of highlighting how little we, you know, how, how we should be careful about our assumptions and how, 
at every stage in the process of sending messages and receiving messages, uh, you know, the data gets transformed in ways that can be pretty unpredictable. But, um, you know, but it's quite fun to, to see the data transformed. And one of the things that we haven't really talked about here, but that we talk about quite a bit in the book are the sonified images, because, you know, it's it's really quite ingenious how that was done. Um, they, they uh, you know, they basically took a lot of images, mostly from National Geographic, um, and used this new machine that was, uh, that had, it, it really was just a complete fluke, but it had just been invented previously. It, there was one machine, one company in Colorado that, you know, that um, was able to produce this, this sonify, the sonification of images. It was a kind of scanner that turned visual information into sonic information. And so, you know, they did this with, uh, with a number of, of, uh, of photos and the sonified data contains all the information that you need in order to reproduce the images um, in sonified form. And at that stage, it really is just data. Right? I mean, it's sort of a string of events and non-events, sounds and silences um, that can be converted into any sensory modality you want. I mean, you know, it makes most sense to us as humans as pictures, um, but they, you know, they can also exist as sounds. They don't really make much sense to us as sounds. They're just a buzz at, I forget what it is, like 39 hertz. Um, so we hear it as a buzzing sound, but again, that's just a function of our ears. That's the way our ears operate. And the, the problem for you know, an alien listener would be that it's, it's stored on the same grooves of the golden record as the music and as the greetings and as all the other stuff. And they would have no way of knowing that these particular sounds are meant to be read in a different way from everything else. So, you know, for all they know, it could just be a different musical style that just happens to be very buzzy and kind of monotonous. Um, it, but, it, it seems clear to me that the next time we send out a Voyager with a record on it, we should send a robot. That would be really good, yeah. First of all, tell them how to play the record. Yes. yes. And also, if they only have fins and no hands, it could actually help them <laughs> to do it. Anyhow, thanks. Nice. Sorry, this was such a great book. I, I loved reading it and I loved having uh, Daniel from Hong Kong and Alex, who's possibly in the next building. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for writing this book, which is really the most playful. Um, book on musicology I've ever read. No, it's the most playful <laughs> book on uh, that has, it's also scientific uh, that I've read. So thank you very much. And thank you for uh, talking to us tonight. Thanks so much for having us. It's great. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. I just want to thank you, Alex and Daniel, for this fantastic conversation and Melissa for your excellent moderation. Please do check out Alien Listening and purchase a copy at harvard.com. It sounds so fascinating. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a great night and keep reading and please be well. Thank you so much. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.